let's hear it for Kirk, who had to read a very difficult, a long passage. And I really wish you hadn't sung it, honestly. I think that'd be great. <laughs> well, the good news, friends, is that we have done it. We have read the entire book of Habakkuk. Over the course of these last few weeks, we started with chapter 1, verse 1, and here we are ending with chapter 3. We conclude our series today, When God Doesn't. All about the times in our lives when it feels as though God is absent. Or maybe even worse, when God is uncaring. We've examined how Habakkuk expressed his questions and his complaints to God over God's failure, as Habakkuk saw it, to do what had been hoped. We explored the differences between the reality of God's worldview and our own expectations. We've considered where faith might leave us in that gap as we contend with natural consequences from ourselves and others around us. And today we wrap it all up with Habakkuk's final prayer, his final words, his closing thoughts on what to do with all the pain of this world as it bears down on us. So the only question left to answer is, where does Habakkuk end up after all is said and done? <coughs> Let's pray first, and then we'll dig into that question. Spirit of living God, fall fresh on us. Open us to your spirit moving in our midst, in our hearts and our minds and our very being. Amen. If you've been keeping track throughout this sermon series, then you've likely noticed that those first few verses, actually the first 15 verses of chapter 3 that Kirk read, feel very much like the rest of of what the prophet has shared so far, chapters 1 and 2. Habakkuk knew full well what most of us know, the reality that life can be brutal at times. Being children of God does not make us immune to the storms of life. Seeking God's heart does not exempt us from suffering and pain. In this final prayer of Habakkuk, Habakkuk does not actually get an answer to his questions asking why. Instead, God reveals God's power and presence at work in the world through a vision that Habakkuk sees. At least that's how Habakkuk interprets it. Here's a small portion as a reminder of that vision from chapter 3. Habakkuk says, rays of light flash from God's hands where awesome power is hidden. Pestilence marches before God. Plague follows close behind. When the Holy One stops, the earth shakes. When Yahweh looks, the nations tremble. God shatters the everlasting mountains and levels the eternal hills. This is the Eternal One. That sounds an awful lot like Godzilla, not necessarily God, doesn't it? <clears throat> this imaging of God's person and power fills much of the chapter with Habakkuk, relaying how he has perceived God. Eventually, Habakkuk comes to the conclusion that it's not anger that prompts Yahweh to action, but rather love. He asks of this vision, was it in anger, Lord, that you struck the rivers and parted the sea? Were you displeased with them? No, he says, you were sending your chariots of salvation. So in the midst of the chaos of the earth, Habakkuk sees God at work out of love. And seeing all that he has seen, Habakkuk is rocked to his core. Even when the Mighty One is on your side, there is still fear. In verse 16, Habakkuk expresses how little each of us are in the face of a big God. Having encountered God so vividly, he's literally weak in the knees, unable to make a sound even though his lips are moving. 
all too aware of his finite fragility. Habakkuk has seen the future as God sees it. And what does he offer up in response? In the midst of that fear, the weakness of his knees, and his inability to speak, he offers something surprising. He offers trust, hope, dare we say even joy, despite what his current circumstances seem to warrant. In these last three verses of Habakkuk's story, he writes, even though the fig trees have no blossoms, hear the doom in his voice, and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, the fields lie empty and barren, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. Despite all that Habakkuk has endured, despite his frustrations with God's timing, despite his feeling of smallness, Habakkuk comes to this place in his own mind and spirit where his worship of the Holy One is not contingent upon circumstances. I think the one thing that the church is often so quick to do is to tell glory stories. Stories of how people have experienced maybe what we might even call miracles of God. Where circumstances in their lives have changed for the better. But I think we also need to get better at telling the stories of those who, although they have faith that could probably move mountains, those mountains stay put. And they live a deep faith and joy in the midst of endurance. We need to hear the testimonies of those like Habakkuk who don't get the breakthrough miracle, but continue to know and express joy even in the heartbreak of life. So today, we will hear from a few folks who know a little something about this. Folks who have maintained joy in the face of incredibly difficult circumstances. We'll start with the wonderful Babb family. They've been a part of Downey for the last several years. Katrina and Jess are going to come and share a bit about their circumstances and tell us how they've remained positive and joyful and hopeful, even in the most trying of times. It's good to go. It's ready to go. Oh, so you already heard me back there. Um, I'm Katrina, this is Jess, and you've seen our kids. Um, Brooklyn is seven, and the boys are twins, and they're six. And Jess gets really nervous speaking in front of people, but she really wanted to share, and um, given how much this has impacted her life over the last seven years, uh, we wanted to try to do this. So we have Kleenexes, and we're gonna give it a shot. <laughs> All right, if you see me vibrate off the stage, don't worry. Um, Okay, so everyone has issues that can make life difficult. Ray just has some that are more visible. Um, about six years ago, we got a call from our foster care agency stating that there were some healthy twin boys uh, that were just born who are ready to come home from the hospital. So Trina and I, super excited, happy dance, uh, went to the hospital. Uh, we walked in and walked up to, well, first of all, we went to the NICU. I was like, oh, okay, well, all right, ever go in and we see two theoretical babies inside a little incubator thing where Liam was two pounds and seven ounces and Ray was two pounds and 11 ounces. Um, I'm not gonna lie, they looked weird, but uh, they were both were connected to lots of hoses and cords and they were so small that that's mostly what you saw. Um, 
Ray was transferred to Riley a couple days later because he was really having trouble breathing. So he went there and they, Liam, oh, wait, I'm sorry. And then we fast forward like three months. Trina and I were there a lot. I don't know if this is going on and off. Um, as much as we could. And about when they were three months old, Liam came home, very exciting. And we were presented with a life-changing decision regarding Raymond. Uh, we were told that he would need a trach and would need to be on a vent for an unknown amount of time. Um, and the doctors were pretty confident that if he didn't come home with us, that it was unlikely that he would end up with someone who could or would give him around the clock care that he needed in an environment that he could live in. So we had to decide whether it was to trach him, put him on a ventilator, train and I to learn how to become NICU nurses and see what happens. We didn't know if he would live through the week. We didn't know anything. Um, and after talking and thinking about it, uh, as you can tell, we decided to go for it. Um, over the next three months, so while well, he was three months to six months, uh, Trina and I hung out in the PICU with him and we had to go through numerous hours of training to learn how to, um, what did I say? Uh, to learn how to utilize troubleshoot and maintain his ventilator and he has a g-tube with a feeding pump we had to learn how to do trach changes we had to do it by ourselves within 30 seconds was one of the things that we had to be able to do to pass because they would not let us leave until they felt confident that we could do our jobs um, and then what to do when not if he either stops breathing or his oxygen levels drop um, the day that we brought him home was super exciting and also in that time frame we got Brooklyn back so when we got home we had we went from no kids about six months later to having two medically fragile kids two little boys and Brooklyn who was about a year and a half old um, it, every day was exciting and terrifying uh, we every day also was an adventure um, and a possible trip to the Riley ER which we always had a go bag packed and ready because you never knew what would happen that morning and we still do uh, thankfully um, Jess has always been the Riley mommy so um, I think that through all of this um, on one hand we feel so incredibly like privileged and blessed that we were able to make ends meet while Jess was at home as a full-time uh, vent nurse um, but also um, that uh, we have to just try to find joy and make accommodations to keep living life so um, this is how he was learn to lick. Uh, so throughout the years, um, there's been various stages of um, medical strollers and wagons and uh, ways to uh, transport so that he can still participate in activities and um, the, the different equipment that you can advocate for so that he can still go to a park. And um, we're currently working on how to get a portable oxygen concentrator so we can take our first flight. Um, he still needs oxygen when he sleeps, so if we go anywhere and he might sleep, then we have to get all of his oxygen, but you can't take tanks on the plane, and our concentrator is like, um, is bigger than the chair. So, um, so that's our next step of trying to advocate for that. So, um, I think that through the years we've just learned, uh, how to take, not take no as an answer, and you advocate for more therapists, and you advocate for more, uh, accommodations in the classroom. He's currently in first grade. And um, while he has a whole team, uh, there's about 12 people that meet uh, to um, provide education for Ray. So at school, he has um, an occupational therapist and a speech therapist and a physical therapist and a behavioral team. And, um, and then any, any issues that he has, the conversation is always, how do we make this happen? Not um, if it will happen. So very thankful for the school district. I know that not everyone has that that opportunity. Um, we just tried our first trip to Holiday World 
And uh, from the time that we left until the time we got there, he started to get sick. So thankfully we had oxygen tanks and, and things like that. And we had to decide whether we just go back home or not. And so we decided to go ahead and go. And we rented a stroller and just strolled him around Holiday World and um, had all of us, you know, we, we thought it was gonna be a, a, a light packing, like they're even potty trained now. So I'm like, just one extra outfit and we'll be good to go. So we had like three backpacks and oxygen tanks and a stroller, but, um, but but we were able to still do it. So I think that in the finding joy in difficult times, it's uh, just about how, trying to think about how you can make it happen and how to continue living life um, uh, through that. So is there anything else you wanna say? Uh, I just had one more tiny paragraph here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was, and sometimes it's still very difficult, but our kids are happy, strong, and resilient. Um, as you can see in some of the pictures, Raymond, every time we're in the hospital, once he starts feeling a little bit better, he's very annoying and happy. Mm -hmm. And that's the worst time when you're waiting to go home. I get really upset because he just runs around like a crazy man. Um, but this experience has taught Trina and I how to use our strengths to become a great team. We really had to rely on each other for everything and trust that we had it. Thank you, Katrina, thank you, Jess, for sharing your family story and reminding us how easy we've had it. I've had it, I will speak for me. Next, we'll hear from our dear friends, the Kawiwa family. The Kawiwas came to Downey after fleeing their home country of Uganda. Being uprooted from everything and everyone they knew, they came to America seeking asylum and opportunity but instead found roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. Let's hear a bit of their story as they're joining us. They did message me, they're joining us live in worship on YouTube, so hello, Kawiwa family. And they're also gonna join us via video. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for hosting us once again. We are so glad that we get to speak to the Downey Church. The kids are here to greet you. Say hi. Hello. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay. These are the Chihuahua family. And oh, some people used to call me Bernie. We were in Indiana for about, for about six months. Yeah. And we are so happy. Um, we are so happy that you you received us that the downey church received us as a family um we took we, and toma was there for us thank you so much dear church everybody was there for us thank you for sharing with us the good times and the beautiful seasonal uh, you know times that we had with you the christmas oh everything was good the gifts and all and all melody we don't know what to say but you are so special we also want to share that in this season of joy we know we had a very very tough time i know we uh, in indiana i my studies went to a halt i could not study jane had to have an operation which was so 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 needed um we also couldn't get uh, you know a lawyer to help us you know change change, change things to help jane get her operation and all that and yet we couldn't also work so here we are we had to uh, seek uh, another place to change everything, to make everything go in line. And two months ago, Jen had her operation, and uh, it was a major operation of six hours, but now she's getting better. As you can see, the smile and the brightness of the face. And also, um, the kids are going to school. I am also working on everything to make, uh, to, to make every end meet, and also sustain family. Um, we also got a lawyer. We are so happy. We thank you so much for being there for us as a family. It is not easy, but we are so joyful and we are thanking you for hosting us again today. We hope maybe we shall see you again. We know that, uh, we know that uh, Halloween is coming and uh, Thanksgiving and uh, Christmas and all that. We can't wait, we can't wait. But we thank you so much for being there for us and we hope 
and love to wish you a great great time hello everybody say bye bye thank you love down. you <laughs> thank you <down. laughs>
memories of so many wonderful things. And guess what? That helped. That helped push the despair of gloom right out of my life at that time. Now, I must confess that in the following days after that event, even up to this time, I have had moments of depression, of sadness, and of fear. However, when those moments occur, I can always recall my memories and thank God for the blessings, the many blessings I still have, for my beautiful wife, Anne, who is now not only my constant companion, but also my tender caregiver. For my children, my be beautiful, loving children, whose kindness has been so beneficial and helpful to me in coping with this situation. My grandchildren, my adorable and adoring grandchildren, who have made, given me such joy. And more recently, we are blessed with three new, beautiful, healthy, great-grandchildren, for which we thank God. I am thankful for the opportunity to worship in this church with this loving, caring con congregation. I am thankful for Pastor Melody, whose visits and kind words of comfort and encouragement have been so valuable in helping me cope with this situation. Now, in keeping with this, the theme of this service, I want to digress for just a moment, and I assure you it will just be a moment, to share a joy with you that has brought me tremendous pleasure. Nancy Schoen, a longtime member of this congregation, has a very young grandson named Jameson. Jameson. Jameson is seven years old and often accompanies Nancy to worship services here. Unfortunately, Nancy can't be here today because she recently suffered a fall and broke some ribs. However, on one Sunday morning not long ago, Nancy brought Jameson over to me to introduce us. After the introduction, she explained to Jameson that I was blind and could not see. I sensed that Jameson really didn't understand what that meant, that he wasn't sure what blindness was all about. I even thought that maybe Jameson thought I didn't have eyes and that's why I couldn't see. So to dispel that notion, I took off my sunglasses and I said, look, Jameson, I have eyes, but they're broken and I can't fix them and that's why I cannot see. And then in his beautiful seven-year-old childlike voice, he said to me, well, maybe you could wish upon a star now that just struck home. The innocent statement of that young child gave me joy, beauty, and hope. Are you done? No. Oh, oh yes. Yeah, that, that helped me. Help me understand why it has been written that from the mouths of children sometimes come words of great wisdom, and why Jesus said to his disciples, let the little ones come unto me, and why oftentimes at the end of the children's moment here in church, I choke up when we all pray together, thank you for the children. Yes, God, thank you for Jameson, thank you for all the children of this world. Thank you for all life's many blessings. And folks, never despair, because even, beside, even behind the darkest cloud is a silver lining. Sometimes you just have to look for it. Thank you, Babs for sharing your story, Kawiwas and Kent. 
I'm sure I speak for all of us when I say that there is great beauty in the ways that you have found joy in dark times. And you remind us that even though life is difficult, it is also beautiful. We see the same in Habakkuk. For at the end of his journey, he pivoted with the most faithful and powerful word. Yet. Even though Habakkuk declares, things around me don't look so great right now, yet. Yet. I will rejoice in the Lord, the God of my salvation. In this short little book, worry is transformed into worship. Fear turns to faith. Terror becomes trust. Despair morphs into hope. What began with a question mark ends with an exclamation point. Rejoice anyway, beloved. Not because you ignore the challenges of the day, not because we fail to grasp the severity of the brokenness of the world around us, not because we cannot face reality and so we pretend. Rejoice anyway, because there will always be a yet that equips us to pivot toward joy. Rejoice anyway, because life is indeed beautiful. Rejoice anyway, beloved. Amen. Thank you.